So another component with conditions of practice is do we actually need to be performing the task to have some sort of learning? Um, and the idea is that we have some ability to learn a task through the observation of others. Um, so we're going to discuss that here, right? So observational learning allows you to perceptually um, produce a task through um, sight and vision and while rehearsing it in some sort of idea. There are many methods of this observation. You can view a skilled performer um, do the task. You can also view an unskilled performer do the task. You have the idea to do it through videos or simply photos of yourself. And you can view differing skills of performance, uh, whether it is that skilled or unskilled or, or somebody learning the task. Now, observation is done uh, for many reasons, and sometimes it's because you don't have the physical ability at the time to do it, or you're prepping for something, um, or you're trying to learn a new skill and, and you want to see it done for the first time. But then again, I, I want you to think about this. Is what do you watch when you're looking at somebody you perceive it? Um, I have been um, changed in the way I perceive human motion is where much of my analysis now or the way I view things as I'm, I'm critiquing or I'm analyzing in the way it's done or whether or not I can identify something that is a challenge to me. And, and so the idea is that I'm also learning um, how to do things and maybe I'll learn how to play guitar or, or throw to improve my throwing and, and that is something that I do when I go to a sporting event or a concert I'm looking at that type of idea does it differ when you're watching something if it's an activity that you actually participate in I'm watching baseball and then I played baseball or I watched football because I played football but it's different than when I watch hockey or lacrosse because I never played those sports um, on a certain level right and then the idea is you can benefit from an unskilled performer, and, and I want you to be aware of that. Um, the other aspect of this is you do not need to be aware or conscious of the learning that is going on or your ability to um, improve yourself through this observation. Um, one of the ideas is you have this goal-directed imitation or observational learning um, and also DOTI. And so it's the idea that observation provides there's some sort of information that guides your initial attempts to solve a motor challenge. Um, is it beneficial when I'm trying to teach my young boys to ride their bike without a training wheel to watch somebody else do it? And it isn't more beneficial to watch me do it or watch one of their classmates do it or a neighbor do it. Um, the ability of, of this it reduces the amount of time for them to discover. And, and through this um, unknown observation, they are processing on how to do it. We'll talk about that. Um, this idea that you have some sort of prediction or it predicts in it. So you, you are learning how to imitate that process based off this cognitive decomposing of what you see. You are building those neural pathways through the process and then you are creating that hierarchy of goals and sub goals. So sometimes, in, and maybe you break it down to tasks when you have somebody watching and, and looking the start versus um, what happens when you get up. So the idea is through this juggling idea, I mean, is it, was it beneficial for you to do some juggling? And, and it was beneficial in this, in this process um, to have a group that did some observational learning versus a control group that did not watch anybody. And you can see um, the number here is the number of completed 66 consecutive cycles, um, or sorry, completion of six consecutive juggling cycles, that should be a six, um, and through the process. You can see the observational learning group was the only one that actually succeeded because they probably looked at things in this observation and were able to learn how to perform or how to correct their abilities to juggle. Going forward, these are just a couple different scores showing, again, the observational learning benefit in both practice and retention for these individuals. But it's all based on the coordination of these limbs and the torsal and the frontal plane. That's what this score was. And so they were able to better orient their limbs in order to catch the ball and produce the juggling motion. Again, here's another one, which is a measure of the figure eight of the trajectory of the ball, which is essential in the scoring of the juggling. 
And then you have um, another process, which is the serial task. And you had six trials of unique sequence um, and a query keyboard with six boxes. Um, and so the observer was able to watch the experimenter and the non-experimenter had to solve something else during the process to keep their mind moving and going. So here you have that cognitive process and basically you're just trying to follow the task to hit this, the necessary blocks and go through the process. Um, again, there is um, the ability of the observer or those observing to do a beneficial in movement seconds to create complete the task. Um, again, we have the cognitive process going through and the learned behavior was much better in the process for those in observational learning. I will post the Blandin um, at all paper two and please take some time to review that. Now, this observational learning um, is really important and it's been proven and it's been shown, I'll correct myself, it's been shown to occur in um, the uh, monkeys through this thing called a mirror neuron. Now a mirror neuron is a class of visuomotor neurons that are located within the premotor and parietal cortices. And they are, again, they are motor um, neurons in the brain that are supposed to fire during the execution of tasks. What has been shown in these monkeys is there is um, also firing in a very similar manner um, to that when they had observed somebody else doing these goal-directed motor acts. So now it is seen that these motor mirror neurons are firing both through the execution and observation of these goal-directed tasks. Um, so we'll look at this, and I, and I really want you to spend some time studying mirror neurons and going through the process. But so this idea is that you have the ability to generate some firings in these neurons when the task is observed in something else. Now, the idea is this. there is a very important um, coding basis and sometimes it's sensitive to characteristics. So is it direct? When we talk about this, in, in, it fires differently if the individual that you're observing um, is doing something within um, a certain area around you. And a lot of times your people talk about this as a motor space, right? Um, so based on whether or not the goal of the movement is a motor, or how distant or how far away they are, the point of view somebody is in relation to this. Um, the characteristics of the observed movements have an idea with the direction of walking with respect to the observer, um, how articulated the movement is with the arms and legs, are they outstretched, are they close to the body, whether you're standing or static snapshots or specific of different body parts. So all these are going to come into the play um, with how active your mirror neurons are when you're observing the motion. And if we look at this, this is the idea of uh, initially, right? So here we have, this is representative of some food of the monkey. If the monkey reaches for the food and eats the food, this is the task um, of certain neurons that are on firing. If the monkey visualizes a person in front of them reaching, the same or range of firing happens, although you do see it's a little less in magnitude, but the idea is the same motor neurons are firing as opposed to not. Now, going further, the idea is what is the task and how relative does it recur? Now, if the idea is grasp to eat here, you do see a greater similarity in the task because it is a task to eat than you do a grasp to place. However, there is still some action but the similarities more represent each other when it is a function that is essential for the, the person or the monkey in this case to produce, and that is the grass to eat. Additionally, there are different motor neurons and each one may fire differently depending on the task, right? Peripersonal space, which is whether or not that food is in the space of the monkey, it's personal space, or whether or not it's out. And there may be different neurons, neuron one and neuron two, that fire in response to that. And so this is the idea of, although they're all in the same motor cortex and cortices, um, the idea is that some respond where it's closer or whether it's outside of their own personal space.
The other one is the idea that we go forward and we're talking about the model skill level. And so do highly skilled models elicit a better learning than an unskilled? Do I always need to watch somebody's skill? And, and the answer is no. So sometimes the idea of watching somebody struggle to learn better is going to be beneficial and sometimes it's more beneficial than others. Um, and that is because through combining this observation and the knowledge of the results, you can process individually in yourself and try to correct the movement pattern or what is lost or how to correct it. And that is known as combining the observation of a skill or learned behavior and the results. The important part here is that you need to combine the observation and the knowledge of results. You need to know the outcome of their movement in order for this to occur. And as the observer in watching somebody who is doing a non-skilled or unskilled, you have the visual and auditory information provided from the model and about the movement, have some sort of augmented feedback as knowledge results, and then you see the success of that model's attempts as feedback, and then it provides you, helps them, and see their corrections for the next. And this is evident in, in a number of studies, but the idea is that a correct model is repeated exposure to perfect executing of timing goals where a learning model may be more beneficial during with a react with mostly with um, the, the knowledge of results because you need to see um, the end result while you're going through. Now, you can see here that um, the learning model with knowledge of results, it produces the best um, absolute error, which is again um, talking about the um, accuracy. So the better the absolute error, the better it is. Somebody without the learning model without the knowledge results is the worst. So it's more beneficial to watch a correct model than it is to watch uh, a learning model without knowledge of results. So in order for this learning model to be uh, beneficial, you need to have the knowledge of results.